day that can guide our reflections and, and uh, prepare us um, to go to the table of Christ that is set for us today. We turn to the Gospel of Mark. Um, today is the day we read the first verses of this Gospel. Um, Mark's Gospel doesn't begin like the other ones do, particularly Matthew and Luke. On Christmas Eve, those are the ones we hear from. We hear from the Gospel of Matthew and Luke because they tell us about a baby named Jesus who was to be born. And that's how we learn the story of that birth. But in Mark's Gospel, we don't have such a beginning. Mark's Gospel is the shortest one. And it doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus nor with Jesus as a young man in the temple. For example, it begins with John the Baptist making a proclamation about the one who is to come. And in short order, Jesus as an adult appears on the scene. So we're mindful of that as we read from Mark's Gospel, but this is, this is the beginning. This is the beginning for Mark, and a powerful beginning at that. Let us hear about John the Baptist, we believe to be the cousin of Jesus. His parents were Elizabeth and Zechariah. He was born the same time Jesus was born, right at the same time. Elizabeth and Mary were, were expecting together. And so we now have John as an adult a prophet coming to us from the wilderness. Let us hear these words. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, Mark's Gospel says, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people from Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one, is, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear words from John the Baptist, the first prophet that the people of Israel had known in about 200 years. Words from a man who's described as coming out with, with uh, this crazy outfit, eating a diet of locusts and wild honey. We can only imagine what we would have thought seeing him by this river 2,000 years ago. He's the first prophet in 200 years, literally coming out of the, did he have to take Isaiah so seriously? Literally coming out of the wilderness to proclaim this preparation of the way. We know what will happen to John, Jesus' cousin. It won't be long before John has offended just about everybody, all the religious leaders, all of those who think that they know how to prepare their own way. Thank you very much. You don't need to tell me what to do. All of those who think that they're in the right positions of authority to know best what God expects of them. John will continue this sort of preaching until it gets him killed. Alice McKenzie, a preaching professor at one of our United Methodist seminaries, writes about this scripture, maybe because we know what is coming for John, and we know how hard his life will be, and we know that his words are often hard to hear, especially when we're surrounded by lights and decorations and Christmas trees. He seems awfully forceful, and he doesn't look very pretty. So maybe, she says, this year we could get John a new job. 
for Christmas. Maybe we should look for John at a job, because John as prophet in the River Jordan with the outfit and the harsh language about repentance is often hard to hear. And we know it's not going to get him anywhere but trouble. So here is what she speculates might be some good job alternatives for John. Shall we hear that? Okay. Alice McKenzie says, you know, if John keeps this up, we fear for his life. We worry for where this talk might get him. If we could just keep him occupied for the next few weeks, he might be okay. Maybe we could find him another job. Maybe he could be a personal shopper. What do you think? Would you take shopping tips from John? We could sit him down at our kitchen table and let him flip through the advertisements. First, he could make his own Christmas list for Cousin Jesus and his parents, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and his Aunt Mary and his Uncle Joseph. Then he could help make your list for you. Maybe we could take him along to some brunches at open houses for Christmas. I don't think I would take him to a brunch personally. They might not serve locusts. What do you think? She said, perhaps we could take him to the costume shop and help him rent a red suit with a white beard, and then we could get him a job as the mall Santa. What do you think? He could sit on the Santa throne in the middle of the mall, listening to our children and grandchildren tell him what they want for Christmas. Can anybody help John the Baptist find another job this Christmas? We ponder that question, albeit silly, because we do know what's ahead for John. And we do often find his words to be a bit harsh as we worship during Christmas. We like Christmas carols and they make us feel good. But John reminds us that we're supposed to be doing something in this season. That Advent requires us to be preparing ourselves. And I know I'm busy preparing lots of other things, not me. But we know that in reality, John doesn't need another job because John is doing his job very well, isn't he? John's a good prophet. And he's right where he needs to be, coming out of the wilderness, preaching loudly, drawing crowds, and telling the truth. He would not make a good mall Santa because he's probably uninterested in what kids want for Christmas. John is interested in telling us what God wants from us. And that's pretty cool. So John should probably keep his job. But as we listen to John's truth-telling about what we most need from Christmas, it's kind of hard to hear. John has top on our Christmas list that we need a turnaround. The Greek word is metanoia. It means repentance. John says that's what you need for Christmas. A turnaround. 180 degrees. It was needed 2,000 years ago, and apparently we still need it. It's remained at the top of the Christmas list ever since. A turnaround. Repent. Prepare the way of the Lord. For me, each year, this week is really my favorite in the weeks of Advent. Last week, the first Sunday in Advent, we typically spend time on the prophets because we talk about of the Son of God. And so the first week of Advent, just like last week, that's what we talked about in worship. What the prophets have to say, and I like what they have to say good enough. Now, next week and the week after, the third and fourth Sundays in Advent, we often hear more about Mary and Joseph. We start talking about the details. How did this all happen? What are we really planning for and preparing for on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day? But today, the second Sunday of Advent, we hear from John the Baptist every year. Prepare the way of the Lord. And I love it. And maybe those of you who are preparers like me love it. 
and that any obstacle can be overcome, that I will never leave you, and that you have all the strength you need to turn around. So we go to the Lord's table today during the season of Advent, this, the second Sunday of this beautiful season, and we ask that the Lord meet us at this table to help us in that turnaround, to help us to get rid of the obstacles in our path, to help us to prepare the way to the manger, not to some other place that gets us nowhere, but to the manger where Christ is born and lives in each of our hearts and lives. So we remember as we gather in worship today, the night Jesus sat with his disciples, and he blessed the bread and he broke it, and he said, take eat. This is my body broken for you. Each time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. Because you'll need it. And after supper, he took the cup and offered it to them as well, saying, Take drink, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. Because you'll need it. So we gather today at this table because we need it. We need nourishment for the path that we are meant to prepare for. Oh Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to be present in this place and to fall upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us, Lord, your body, redeemed by your blood, that we might be continue to gather around your table until we feast at your heavenly banquet. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As United Methodists, we practice this open table, which means anyone here today who is open to the love of God in your hearts is welcome to receive communion at this table today. In just a few moments, I'll invite you to come forward. And when you do I'll invite those assisting me with 